Good morning friends. Uh, today I am going to talk about the uh, topic which is actually very familiar to all of you that is uh, criminal law and this is in fact this is 17th lecture of uh, law and economics in the series. So we normally know that what is uh, criminal law. Criminal law is unlike uh, the other laws which we are so far discussed is completely different and the the people who uh, play as party in the criminal law is completely uh, different to that of the earlier one where what in the civil cases like uh, the tortious case uh, contract breach or uh, the property case everywhere uh, the party that is the person who is sued is actually the person who directly got injured or his property was being uh, violated or property rights right being violated or the, uh, the contract is broken or the, uh, the the accident which was being harmed so this is a personal kind of thing and it is individual in that context uh, it has always been done by individual versus individual whereas in the criminal law things are going to be completely different so uh, in the civil law of the sense of it is basically the individual's law or the people civil civilies law so no civil this is again uh, the civil law is not what we mean by the civil law tradition of the napoleonic court or uh, uh, the code Napoleon which we have already discussed uh, but uh, this is part of the uh, common law tradition that is within the British law this is also part of actually the Napoleonic law where that is also comes under the Napoleon which is called the civil law tradition and the common law so every tradition crime is being deal, dealt with differently with the way that uh, this is from historical time that is uh, from the Hammurabi's code uh, or even older than that so all the written code the criminal laws are being always or it, it always been uh, treated differently even that is very interesting uh, to deal with the uh, the categorization of William Blackstone uh, about uh, the the criminal the, the rights and wrong of uh, his own classification so uh, however we are not going to the details of that uh, but uh, the criminal uh, law we mean as I said uh, this is with the uh, context or, or in the context of uh, the crime is always been treated not as against an individual that is the first categorization which is we mean which 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 uh, we have to keep in mind so case where one private individual is using another is always the case of uh, civil law whereas uh, generally looking uh, for monetary compensation uh, is the, uh, the particular uh, feature of a civil law or civil uh, problem or it is what does we have seen in the case of uh, a contract in the case of uh, accidents in the case of uh, uh, breach of property so for some sort of a wrong that was done uh, to these individuals are the basis of this uh, kind of compensation so this is an individual get harmed and that harm is being compensated on in different forms it can be punitive or non-punitive damage in that sense so some cases are handled differently such as uh, uh, for example, uh, the quotation of uh, Friedman is very interest, uh, interesting. Uh, we saw earlier that is when someone shoots you, you call a cop. When he runs his car into you, you call a lawyer. So this is what uh, in the in the in the beginning of the tort case. This was actually uh, the quotation which we had used. So uh, both are uh, uh, in that sense harming the individual, right? somebody shoot you and somebody is running uh, try to run over you so you call a lawyer instead of a cop so in the later case so uh, but in the former case it is not but necessarily you may be also calling 
uh depending on uh, the kind of uh, legal structure and the, the sort of uh, the strength of the legal uh the, the, the rule of law in that particular uh, region so uh the the the, the whole discussions a discussion was made in fact uh, till this point is basically on the civil part that is individual getting compensation for the harm which they had undergone whatever so now let's talk about a very different narrative of all this actions like now criminal law is particularly uh, is uh, important when we talk about the uh, the, the particular wrongful act having an intention or it is intended to do wrong so in the accident case we have said it's accident it was there is no intention there is a harm but that harm is not intentional if the harm is intentional then the very uh, accident will turn as a crime so this is what is actually the, the simplified uh, definition and understanding of the difference between a tort an accident and a crime criminal act so case brought by government again another difference in the uh, criminal um, trial or criminal cases uh, is that um, the, the 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 party which is actually the harm is not doing against an individual it is actually doing against the state or the particular authority so any act is actually a violation of the authority so uh, that means uh, if uh, somebody intend to kill somebody it imply that the this is actually violates the very uh, rule of law of that land or the authority of the land so if the authority of the land is been violated then the authority itself or uh themselves can actually take a a, a case or they are the uh, party which is going to def, uh, you know uh, prosecute the other party so there is something uh, which is very interesting in this case again this is against the state it's the, as i said uh, crime is always been treated as an act against the state it is not act against an individual though we commit uh most of the things is against the individual but that is become crime because it is actually prohibited by the state okay so uh, in a rough understanding is that one civil uh, uh, as we categorized and analyzed so far is that uh, the the erstwhile discussions are against individuals and this is not against individual this is against state okay so then the the analytical tool and uh, points which we had discussed uh, is sufficient or not is also a question so again in the the, the person who is actually uh, start revealing the, the the possibility of this is uh, none other than gary s becker but because analysis itself is again has to be carefully understood uh, in this context okay so let us now go to the details of it and uh, a harm done tend to be public as well as private is the characteristics which i have already mentioned uh, where in the in the criminal case again uh, you have to be very careful about the 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 possibility of a person's involvement that is the standard of proof of punishing a person is very very high under the um, civil uh, sorry criminal law with that of the civil one which we had already discussed so if found guilty defendant will be punished that is the result the end result of what is a uh, criminal laws law uh, application so just like uh, with the civil law to achieve now as we have already uh, you know talked about that is uh, most of the time the interest of the law and economics is mean is always applying this norm of efficiency to understand 
whether the pie is been uh, distributed or done you know uh, efficiently or whatever so to achieve efficiency in that context let us discuss first that is what we can do and then later on we can move on in the due course of time a critical appraisal of the same okay so just like what we have done in the earlier lectures and all so achieve efficiency you what is actually we mean is that to minimize social cost all right so as we have already said that the crime that act is itself is an act against the state then uh, it is perfectly rationalizable that uh, that act has to minimize the cost which is inflict upon society so if the social cost is minimized uh, then you can say that you have an efficient criminal law in that particular that means uh, less likely uh, cost of, 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 uh, to the society uh, under that particular criminal law so social cost consists of different thing as we know it is not as simple as we think so social cost of crime that are committed that is the first component that is what is actually the social cost of crime then cost of detecting or catching that criminal then comes uh, the cost of punishing the offender uh, these three things are broadly covers most of the cost involved in the uh social cost category because uh, crime is against the state and since it is against the state state is going to have a cost that cost is nothing but the cost of crime itself and then the criminal the possibility of catching the criminal and punishing the criminal so uh, in that sense in an answer what we need is that you need uh, uh, in order to implement a criminal law you need a good uh, prison you need a good jail system you need a prison system a jail and prison system and you also need a good police system which is able to uh, track the crime and then uh, bring the people in front of the court and even if there itself there also there is a cost involved that is the people has to be kept and they have to be delivered because we don't know whether there is a, a, the crime is done by the person uh, or not so this is these are the kind of uh, cost involved and now uh, since uh, as we said it is against the state uh, there is a lot of uh, i think the state has to uh, manage or it has to you know find that this has been done by that person so the standard higher standard of proof uh, itself gives comes up with a very very high cost so plus what is actually the uh, the harm which has been done because of this crime all right so this is what is all comes or kind of constitute the social cost of the crime so uh, theoretically that is even true and we will go uh, to the deep uh, a deeper understanding the same in the uh, subsequent uh, lecture so let us first uh, concentrate on intent so we said that uh, we need uh, the, the crime need uh, just like in the harm which uh, in the tort case we need uh, uh, a harm to be done and uh, that is uh, then the causality here uh, not only the causality and the then in the due care level whether you have taken any you know standard of care but in this case whether you irrespective whether you took care or not if it is intentional then oh, everything goes wrong so unlike a tort a crime generally requires intent so uh, it is a uh, immensely that is what is intent mean you you need to have a kind of uh, uh, an intention or mens rea which means a guilty mind so what you have the act itself done by the guilty mind so literal intent occasionally not required that is you have been hired as a lifeguard or a nurse you show up to work drunk and as a result someone dies then it is criminal negligence homicide then so sometime intent is enough 
even without harm now so this question is always very important that is do we really need to uh, harm a person that intention uh, uh, intention is enough not necessarily you have to harm a person so attempted murder murder is actually killing that person but attempted murder means the person is not dead but he was been attempted or sort of thing so the intention is there in that sense then only you, that, that itself sufficient to prove that the person is uh, guilty so criminal cases are brought by the state as we said earlier that it is just actually since against the state uh, the case is always been you know brought out by the state itself so recall wrongful death tort cases now victim is dead can't receive compensation again uh, suppose if you the, the accident happens a fatal accident happens so the victim is dead anyway so who is going to get compensation it is no longer the victim so in individual perspective uh, when it comes to individual perspective if uh, i am going to get my uh, benefit or the, that is the suffering which i am uh, you know a sort of uh, uh, bearing uh, to that of the benefit then that logic will not be uh, very suitable under this particular law or that is why we need this law all right because that sort of a logic will never work always so it it will never work in this case so victim is dead can't receive compensation therefore the individual to individual compensation is not actually the the, the case here then who will get benefit so family friends can sue for lost wage lost compensation etc another point now criminal case don't require living victim that is the first point you don't require a living victim this allows prosecution of victimless crimes so theory is that all crimes harm the public and the public bads it has been treated as a public bad so that is breakdown of law and order in society harms everyone so public uh, represented by the state that is uh, brings criminal action this is why the importance of public prosecutor comes in and the state is how uh, if you have a good state you may be having a lot of public prosecute of different kind to try such cases then distinction between uh, civil remedy and punishment uh, in this context is very relevant uh, to look into that is under the nuisance law contract law tort law damage serves two purpose a compensate the victim b cause injurer to internalize cost of harm done which we have already discussed when injurers internalize harm we got pollution we get pollution we or breach or accident only when they are efficient so so this is what we have seen uh, there but in the criminal law intention is to deter crime so for the first and foremost uh, intention of the criminal law itself is to deter crime so this is what is called the deterrence effect so we will come to that so that is prevent them entirely not just the inefficient one so uh, in the in the tort and contract as well as property cases which we referred earlier everything is actually uh, you have a sort of uh, benchmark and that benchmark is saying that if it is inefficient don't do it but in this case there is nothing called inefficient of that kind so conceptually you are trying to make it zero so prevent them entirely so still if it happens then actually what we have to do punish with very uh, punish with severity so this is what is the kind of you know uh, trade off which uh, uh, dealt under the and criminal law so punishment need not be limited to magnitude of harm done again this is very very important and the criminal punishment that is the imprisonment execution destroy results everything is 
the part of the criminal uh, trial okay and make criminal worse off all this is actually going to make the criminals criminal uh, criminal's life uh, or the private person who done this harm uh, uh, very bad so it is always makes a person still worse off situation earlier what in the tort case also we have seen that some harm has done and the person in this in the, in the greater case is actually the strict liability case where if some harm has done then the person has to compensate therefore the person is strictly liable if the person is strictly liable then uh, he or she is going to have lose uh, this sort of uh, loss and uh, that is inevitable but uh, in this case uh, it is even greater that cost is going to be even greater so make that is for sure criminal gets a worse of kind of situation now this is what has normally been understood in the criminal under, uh, criminal loss perspective so exposed punishment is inefficient again exposed punishment is inefficient uh in this context also so the criminal case have higher standard as we said at the third point uh, so let's uh, look into that aspect so most civil case a preponderance of the evidence is uh, important that is interpreted as 51% certainty plaintiff is correct so this is what is the most that is not what we have uh, going to basically you know understand as well as consider uh, but uh, what we have to have here is that you have to have most the certainty okay for punitive damage uh, clear and convincing evidence is required high degree of certainty in criminal case prosecution must prove guilty beyond a reasonable doubt so this is most important one so under uh, other case if you have a probability which is a high probability then you will get a punitive damage or um, you get kind of um uh, compensation in the contract and uh, tortious case and all but under criminal law you have to prove it beyond beyond a reasonable doubt because unless you prove Uh, beyond reasonable doubt uh, the, the the punishment uh, is not going to take place so why so much higher so is the question uh, think about error cost in either tort or criminal case so uh, that is uh, the probability of wrongful exoneration times social cost of wrongful exoneration probability of wrongful conviction times uh, social cost of wrongful conviction so in the first one tort reduced precaution uh, the same excessive precaution so this is what is the case and the criminal reduced deterrence criminal excessive deterrence no i think i we have to be very careful and social cost of excessive punishment again now if false positive uh, that is if false positive are more costly in criminal law such as conviction should require more setting so this is something which you have to be very careful to understand that is the probability of wrongful exoneration and social cost of wrongful exoneration um it determines uh, the uh, the deterrence level all right that is uh, but uh, probability of wrongful conviction uh, apply a time social cost of wrongful conviction um is i think this this part is a bit interesting like uh, probability of conviction and uh, uh, social cost of the wrongful conviction uh, whether that is going to oh, make a higher precaution or higher excessive deterrence um we will see that in the com- coming part okay are crimes ever efficient so this is next question so 
So most crimes are clearly inefficient. To steal my laptop, you might break my car window and uh, my laptop is worth more to me than the other person. Stolen cars are worth much less than legally owned one. And if you value my car more than me, there is a legal alternative to you stealing it. All this. But Friedman offers example of efficient crimes. So let us look into it. So starving hiker, starving hiker lost in the woods. Finds cabin with a no, nobody home, breaks in and steals food. So efficient murder. Rich guy decided to drive immense pleasure from hunting uh, a human. Offers 10 people 1 million each to draw straw. He gets to hunt and kill the loser. If they all are agree, is this transaction efficient? So this is a question which we have to uh, talk about because even if people are ready to accept the kind of offer and and the person has done harm the question is that is the person entitled to do it so let us look into a, an example a case uh, which was a real case so you may be knowing this person uh, Armin Mew in 2001 Armin Mew posted an ad online looking for a well-built 18 to 30 year old to be slaughtered and then consumed. This was the ad. Herman Mew, a German person, and someone answered. So they met, discussed it, and agreed Mews would kill and eat the guy. Okay? So he did and videotaped it. At the time, cannibal, cannibalism was not illegal in Germany. So 2001, remember. 20 years back. So is it a crime to kill someone who has consented to be murdered? Now this question is often uh, comes in different context. Uh, the same can be even asked uh, in the case of violation, physical violation or um, gender violation or in any sort of assault normally comes now termed under uh, harassment people can have well, what is wrong with or whether we can have all that so these actually bring uh, a lot of discussion so Armin Mew's case is a classic case so we will discuss it uh, in the in the during the time of this crime there was no illegality of cannibalism in Germany so is it a crime to kill someone who has consented to be murdered is then comes with a lot of relevance. So in 2004, Mew was convicted of manslaughter. In 2006, he was retried, convicted of murder, sentenced to life in prison. But also, if Mew and his victim agreed he should be killed and eaten and no one else was harmed, was this crime efficient? Again, this leaves this question. So why not use tort law to cover crime too? So this again, many people have this doubt. Why don't we actually cover this kind of situation with a tort case? It, because a tort law creates an incentive to avoid harms. Um, so if it worked perfectly, might be no need for criminal law. Um, a reason stop law may not work for certain offenses that is relies on perfect compensation which may be impossible loss of life crippling injury even if possible in theory might be impossible in practice so if probability of being caught by a convict or convicted is less than one deterrence require punishment more severe than benefit received and if we made civil penalties severe enough, criminal might be judgment proof. That means whether they cannot judgment, I mean, whether, or give uh, uh, that kind of, or, you know, or return which has been expected. 
So this is what is called judgment proof. So theory of criminal law. Let's come to the theory of criminal law now. So uh, a theory of criminal law must answer which act should be punished as crime. So this is the first one, first and foremost I think. So um, that is at the, the court you should remember that as you know when you somebody runs over your lawn or you uh, you know you uh, you call a lawyer right so so again if somebody you know points you with a gun or uh, something then you immediately it is called an act of crime and you call a cop so that comes that answers this question that is which act should be punished as crime how should they be punished now the question how should they be punished so if we look into court renewal act should be punished when aim is deterrence act should be priced when aim is internalization so aim should be deterrence when perfect compensation is impossible people own law to protect right instead of interest or enforcement errors undermines liability so this is what is actually the kind of uh, logic which uh, has been given in this standard textbook that is if your punishment is uh, to uh, deter the things then you have to punish that is uh, if you have to you know internalize the the act then you price aim should be deterrence when perfect compensation is impossible then again now people want law to protect right instead of interest right or enforcement errors underlie liability so much of today is uh, uh, from the freedman's book because that is talking about lo talking a lot of things from it so uh the key assumption that is uh, comes with this is uh about the economic model is the rational criminal that is potential criminal way private cost chance of getting caught time severity of punishment minus against benefit so this is what is actually the kind which makes people to uh take decision and that is what is comes under the rational criminal so if enforcement were free we could eliminate crime higher enough police to detect nearly all crime so and uh, there are other possibilities also if enforcement uh, not necessarily free uh, if probability of catching is very high then also the same thing happens because uh, we have uh, examples and we have studies uh, which deals with uh, the sort of for example in india you have a state um, sorry you have a union territory which is lakshadweep and lakshadweep is actually a, 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 a collection of uh, um uh, isles okay islands and uh, uh, there uh, the police station has no case or jails have not not been filled very few people like uh, one lakh people or so in the entire island um well uh, less than one lakh i guess or nearly one lakh people uh but uh, the 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 police stations has no registered crimes okay is it because of people are very good or there is no crime uh again enforcement is not free there yeah. um and uh, the police stations are been often work you know as uh, relief centers and other things okay so higher enough uh, so these are the, uh, the uh, you know incidents which gives us a lot of uh, insights to look into problem okay so let's come to the lecture higher enough police to detect nearly all crimes if there is a cost of, if the cost of crime is very zero uh, punish them very severely so nobody rational rational would commit crime so 
apart from this two logic that is hire enough police and punish them very severely in the election case is very important because uh, there is no lot of uh, police officers again uh, it is not because of a higher punishment something else is actually working there what is that the proximity of catching a person or probability of catching the person and again even if you do a crime you can't hide okay because it's a small island uh, i mean series of island and you can't actually go to mainland you can't escape okay as and when you wish therefore things will come out so the probability of catching is very high the probability natural cause of uh, natural uh, probability is very high then also the crime will be very less all right so but enforcement isn't free making things interest and so in the real world situation and uh, the last point is very important therefore you have to have so many things so actually maybe at the same different case a special case so let us go to the details of it so to deter crime we need uh, to do two things one is catch the offender and the other one is punishment so if you can catch everybody who is committing crime or you get to know then uh, you will less likely do all right at the same time also if you have a higher rate of punishment and order for example i i for an i tooth for tooth kind of hemorrhage court um then also the possibility of pun- crime is less we never say that it's zero so catching higher fraction of offenders is more costly uh but in this case uh, lakshadweep case it is not costly because it's an island uh, it is actually uh, gives a cost to the, the person who commit crime because uh, after crime he will be anyway caught because somebody get to know all right because he, the probability is very high and you can't escape also because it's an island so the mainland is uh, far away far far away uh away from uh, the island they and uh, there are so many restrictions uh in such a way that you know you can't immediately go to the mainland right and so it requires more police more detective so in this case you don't require more police and more detective because of the proximity to space so space is also matters um so more severe punishment also tend to be more expensive in this so this is all actually in in the theory well uh, the other things are important and uh, we are considering it so more severe punishment also tend to be more expensive most common punishment are fines and imprisonment fine costs nothing state even fines don't always work because not everyone can pay them so besides fines most punishments are inefficient makes offenders worse off and are costly to state so to deter crime we need to do two things catch a so i have done that right so so with a ra- a rational criminals uh, rising and expected punishment should lead to fewer crimes being so this is what is expected punishment uh, is one way and proximity catching thing so in the uh, lakshadweepian case that is very high therefore uh, the level of uh, crime would be low one reason okay so on a per crime basis rising either the probability of being caught or the severity of punishment is costly so but as we increase expected punishment we get fewer crimes committed so and maybe fewer offenders we need to detect and punish so the cost of punishing those criminals we do catch could go up or down 
which means the marginal cost of deterring another crime could be positive or negative. So, marginal cost of deterring another crime could be positive or negative. So, some exam uh, examples suppose a particular crime is always inefficient, it harms the rest of the society $10,000 more than benefit the criminal. So, every time an offense offender is caught, he or she is tried, convicted, and imprisoned. The total social cost type punishment is say 1 lakh per criminal court. Recall that the aim of criminal law is to minimize the sum of these three things. The social cost of the crime that are committed to the cost of detection and the cost of crime and the punishing the offender who get caught. So a city is considered hiring additional policemen to dedicate to, de to detecting this particular crime. This change would increase the fraction of the offenders who get caught from 15 to 20 percent. The social cost of crime is as I said. So suppose this increase in the detection would result in decrease in the number of crimes committed from 1000 to 700 a year. So I calculate uh, the effect that hiring the new policeman would have on, on the social cost of crime committed which is a simple calculation that is your 1000 to 10 uh, times 10,000 dollars so which is 10 million so mm, no yeah, yeah 10 million so calculate the so I also calculated that is after the thing it is actually 7 million the effect is the reduction of social cost of crime. So calculate the effect it would have cost trying the punishing offender is actually again uh, 15 million then after this thing 14 million so effect is actually uh, 1 million reduction in the cost of trial and punishment so from an efficient point of view that is most of that city should be willing to pay for the new policeman is uh, say 4 million since this is how much social costs are reduced by having higher so this is one example and if you change this uh, probability and the amount that is now suppose instead of increasing detection decrease number of crime committed from 1000 to 900 a year things are going to be different like reduction of social cost is 1 million then in the second case your punishment uh, punishing offender is actually 3 million increase in the cost of trial and uh, higher detection increase in social cost. So even if the new policemen were free from an efficient point of view we wouldn't want them. So this is what is the example of uh, Friedman says. So when suppose supply of crime is inelastic detecting more of them. Now again supply of crime is inelastic. Okay. Detecting more of them increases social costs. The number of crimes does not drop much, but more is spent punishing those who are caught. When the supply of crime is elastic, detecting more of them reduces social costs. Fewer crimes get committed and fewer criminals need to be punished. Okay. Now this forms the optimal determinants. So, depending on how much the crime rate responded to the deterrence increasing, the likelihood of being caught could reduce social cost by reducing both the number of crimes committed and the number of criminals we have to punish. Increase social cost by increasing the number of criminals we catch and have to punish in addition to the require more spending to detection. So, what does this say about optimal level of deterrence? So, or if you prefer the optimum level of crime or the optimum level of punishment. So let's go to the optimum punishment example. Friedman. So suppose there are some crimes of which expected punishment that is probability of severity is equal to $900. Suppose raising expected punishment is 900 to 901 would deter exactly one crime. Should we do it? Depends whether a social cost of that crime is more or less than the social cost of deterring it. Suppose that raising expected punishment from 9 uh, 100 to uh, 901 would cost $50. Marginal crimes does $1,000 $1, worth of damage. To calculate social cost, 
also need to consider the benefit uh, to the criminal. So marginal criminal uh, crime, marginal crime gets committed when expected punishment is uh, 900, but not when expected punishment is 901. So benefit to criminal is 900. So social cost of that crime is actually 1000 minus 900, which is actually 100. So if social cost of rising expected punishment enough to deter that crime is the $50, we should do it. So this is what is the logic which normally comes around and evolve around. So at efficient level of deterrence, what we mean is cost deterrence, uh, deterring one more crime is equal to social cost of marginal crime. Whereas uh, cost of deterring uh, one more crime is equal to harm to victim minus benefit. Uh, to criminals, criminal is since marginal criminal is an indifferent person, cost to deterring one more crime is equal to harm to victim minus expected punishment. All right, and uh, rearranging it, what we get is actually expected punishment is equal to harm to victim minus marginal cost of deterrence. So at an efficient level of deterrence, expected punishment is equal to harm to victim minus marginal cost of deterrence. When deterrence is free, expected punishment is equal to damage to victim. So offenders internalize cost of action or his or her action. Just like with the tort law leads to only efficient crime. So when deterrence is costly, expected punishment is less than damage to victim. When preventing marginal crime is costly, we allow all efficient crime. So, and some slightly inefficient one because it is cheaper to allow them than to prevent them. So, when marginal cost of deterrence is negative, we should set expected punishment, which is greater than damage uh, to victim. So, when preventing the marginal crime saves money because there are fewer crimes criminals to punish. So, we prevent some efficient crime too because it's cheaper to deter them than to allow them and have punishing them. So aside, why do we count the criminal's benefit? So why count criminal's payoff when calculating social costs? We said fine costs nothing, make offenders worse off, state better off. So why not just say screw the offender, fine raise money and social cost of crime is equal to damage to victim minus benefit of offender. Why not? Because by committing certain acts, you give up right to be counted. So Friedman argues in this way. All right. So we want an economic theory for why things like murder and embezzlement uh, should be treated differently than nuisance and tort. If we start out by assuming they are morally different, we are assuming the answer to our question. If we avoid making assumptions like that and still come up with a reason they should be treated differently, then we have learned something, otherwise not. So the system is, uh, the, uh, that is it would be designed to excuse the largest possible fine out of the convicted criminals using the threat of more unpleasant alternatives for those who fail to pay. So if the fines that victims can pay even under such threat are inadequate. They are supplemented by penal slavery for criminals who can produce more than it costs to guard and feed them. Execution with the organs for feed to sage, that is execute for those who cannot. Any person that do exi exist and do not pay for themselves are as unpleasant as possible so as to produce as much punishment as possible per dollar of imprisonment cost so imprisonment so it is a consistent picture and considerable parts of it can be found in the not very distant past but not pretty one so this is what is now the problem with the efficient punishment punishment rate are uh, punishment are designed to make someone worse off so if punishment has social cost uh, to zero it must make someone else better off with fine state gets the benefit of the money but this creates incentive to or incentive of, uh, for abuse state benefits from convicting people that is very bad drug cases and forfeiture so traffic cameras and yellow lights so do harsher punishment deter crimes another question which we need to ask 
that is hard to answer because hard to separate two effects deterrence when punishment gets more severe crime rates need drop because criminals are afraid of being caught so we have already seen the lecture so incapacitation when punishment gets more severe crime rates may drop because more criminals are already in jail Hessler versus and Levitt natural experiment that is voters in California of 19 in 1982 passed ballot initiative adding five year per prior conviction to sentence for certain crimes found immediate drop of 4% in crimes eligible for enhanced sentence one example so again probability is severity Now, empirically crime level more sensitive to probability of being caught than the severity of the punishment which we have already seen in our case might be that criminals discount future a lot don't care as much about last few years of long uh, prison sentence or total cost of punishment may be more than apparent sentence so punishment is equal to time in jail plus other cost the time spent in jail awaiting trial money spent on lawyers stigma of being convicted criminals etc so which may not be depending on length of sentence so uh 20% uh, of x maybe one year jail plus c is greater than 10% uh, probability times two year jail so not because of 20% of one year is worse than 10% of two years but because 20% of c is more than 10% of c. means becker's idea that the tiny probability very severe punishment may not work in real life all right so the margin of deterrence problem again armed robbery versus armed robbery plus murder this is the example which we had uh, talked start speaking in the beginning of the law and economics lecture so a very important one so you break uh, into rob an isolated house carrying a gun someone works up and confronts you what do you do punishment uh, for murder is very severe If punishment for armed robbery is not so severe, you might leave them alive. If punishment for armed robbery is very severe, you might be better off killing them, right? So, same argument against the three strikes law. That is, as good be hanged for an old sheep as a young lamb. Old English. So, this is what is we have want to talk about. That is, the moral deterrence uh, thing is a very tricky one. this is very very important so uh, this is gives a kind of room for that you don't actually uh, deter uh, sorry you don't impose high punishment in the united states and all you have triple uh, sentence uh, or double sentence uh, life imprisonment and uh, in india you don't have it of that kind so you are life may be 12 or 14 years that's it uh mm-hmm. not till your death uh then in the united states you will get or in the continental europe you will get actually a sentence of maybe you will count like if this sort of a uh, uh, crime then suppose this is actually comes with 10 years of imprisonment some other severe crime you have 12 year or 20 years so if you have done two things then 40 years of sentence So it will rot in jail. So this kind of a uh, severity is there, but in India it is quite strange that you don't have actually this sort of uh, uh, sentence. In the United States, state you have many variety of this kind. So with this uh, uh, note on deterrence and marginal deterrence, I'll end today's no uh, lecture and we will continue this with uh, the next lecture. So thank you, and I hope that all of you enjoyed and understood some of this thing. and if you have any uh, any question or queries just comment uh, in the comment box so thank you very much sir.